So, hello everybody. It's great being here. Um, so the announcement is more like a rock star style here. I'm not used to that. You're a rock star, Michael. Um, thanks for the very warm welcome. Uh, so perhaps just a few words to, to me. Um, I'm working uh, at Bosch in the field of automated driving. I'm with Bosch since 96. Um, started with uh, production in, uh, in Mexico, so it was not a very typical start. And then in 2001, I changed to Bosch and started what you now today would call vehicle systems engineering. What is vehicle systems engineering? That's kind of plugging many things in the car together to make, a, to make sense as a whole. Um, I did uh, vehicle dynamics management, and uh, through several steps, I made my way to, I would say, one of the most, if not the most thrilling thing you can do in auto, in, in automotive industry, and this is automated driving. So before I will take a walk with you through technologies and probably implications of automated driving, let's give some impressions on how our future world may look like. Our world is changing, and this change is visible across the globe. More than 50% of our population now lives in cities. These cities are growing, as is the share of older people in them, while space to live is becoming ever more precious. More and more goods and people need to be transported, pushing the traffic infrastructure to its limits and increasing pollution and noise levels. But the world is waking up. Regulations are calling for stricter limits and cleaner solutions. A transformation has started, powered by new technologies and services. In a world where everything is connected, mobility is being reimagined. Solutions like traffic management, combined with cleaner and more efficient powertrains, and the benefits brought by automated driving, will make our city sustainable and livable. Bosch is driving this change and shaping the future. The future of mobility. So, small teaser on how uh, we figure out the future, and probably you know Bosch from, um, well, what do you know us from? Uh, spark plugs, probably? Okay, I'm very sorry. Uh, I may ask you to leave the room if you have no seats so that we can continue. I'm very sorry. No, it's okay. <laughs> so, you know us for I had spark plugs, dishwashers, right? What more? Drilling. Building. Drilling. 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 Power tools, correct. What more? Engines. Yeah, gasoline injection, uh, diesel injection, um, the one or the other may know us for um, electrical motors which move the windows in the car up and down. So this is, say, the technology that we have grown with and that we have provided with, that's the, uh, the, the automotive industry with, but if we think cars now, we think them pretty different. Cars now, we think them as being electrified, automated and connected, because that is the future of automotive technology. Cars will be more and more electrified and drive an electric powers. Um, they will be automated. You can see that already, that cars get more and more and more intelligence and help the driver to move the vehicle um, more safely, more comfortably, and take more and more the job of the driver while moving the car from A to B. And last but not least, cars will be connected. It was such a great world some years back when we at the car manufacturing industry didn't even think about security and hacking and all these things because we were not connected. We were on our own ecosystem. These days are gone. Cars will be a part, an essential part of the Internet of Things. And they will be connected all time and in any situation in the future. Um, you might ask, why are we doing this automated driving? What, what is this? What drives us to do it? Honestly speaking, it's one of the greatest things you can do in order to give benefit to the society. I've named here about five things that we immediately figure out what these cars will help us. 
to do in the future and improve in the future. One is safety. We know by now that more than 90% of all accidents that happen out there, they are caused by human failure. And human failure is negligence, is not paying attention to the traffic, is sometimes falling asleep, is, I know nobody of you does that, but is probably texting while driving. Um, or your famous, your favorite football team has just lost, so you're a little bit upset, and that is making people to commit failures while driving, and these results in accidents. Automated cars will not commit these accidents. We can train them to be not infringing the rules. Democratization of mobility is one thing that drives me personally very much. Um, you may know that industrialized uh, societies are getting older and older. Just in a few years, more than 30% of all people industrialized societies will be 65 plus. And there will be the day when even when, when me and even you one day should probably drop your driver's license and say, hey, it's not safe for me to drive anymore because I cannot do it physically anymore. When I arrive at this stage, you, you know what? I want to have my technology, my car that we're just building, picking me up at home and bringing me to the pub to have a good beer and chat with my friends instead of staying at home and uh, sole and alone. Higher fuel efficiency. Um, if you drive a car, you know these smart displays in the center where we tell you, please uh, gear shift up, gear shift down, left the foot from the pedal. Why are, do, are we doing that? We are trying to motivate you to consume less gasoline, less energy, pollute less, produce less CO2. Um, we depend on the driver doing that, but we can train an automated car to do it just as we program it. So these cars will drive by themselves very, very ecologically. And on the other hand side, they will drive very smoothly. And driving smoothly means they consume less gasoline as well. And even in the future, thinking way ahead, if all cars would drive automated, all the tremendous gaps that we have between the cars for, for safety, we can reduce them. And as cars drive closer together, they consume less energy due to improved aerodynamics. And that goes up to 39% of, of fuel economy. That's a huge, huge potential that we do have there. Reduced congestion. Um, 30% of the traffic in cities is basically looking for parking spaces. If you would remove all these 30%, because nobody looks for parking space, but just has the car, an automated car that takes him from A to B, and then the car goes for the next customer, then you get rid of a lot of problems in, in, in congestion. And last but not least, um, in average, we spend day by day 56 minutes driving a car. Um, I do not know whether that's your favorite thing to do. I like driving cars, but not every day 56 minutes, especially not when I'm standing in traffic jams. And this time is time I could be given back by a car driving me and taking me from A to B, because this time I can use to read my news, my, my emails, uh, probably work a little bit, or even enjoy film, music, whatsoever. So this is the five basic benefits that we see in automated cars, and this is the reason why we do it and why we think that's a good thing to do it. Um, as we talk about automated cars, I would like to introduce you a little bit to what kind of automated cars do we have, because automation is a broad field. First of all, let's take a look on um, what kind of cars do we have. In the gray area down below, you can see there's basically two types of cars. Cars which are driven individually, so that means it's your car, you own it, or at least you, you have a leasing contract or something like that, and that's your personal mobility device. On the other hand side, we have the car sharing movement. Uh, that's all the cars that they are somewhere parked in, in the streets all around, and you pick one as you need it. But they belong to a company to provide service. So the privately owned cars, uh, as you start bringing them into automation, um, that's kind of an evolutional change. That means we introduce more and more and more technology step by step to make them better. Why are we doing that? It's pretty expensive to do a big leap. So we do it step by step so that people still are able to pay for it. And that is the reason why we start with uh, driver assistance like uh, uh, steering control or like uh, um, keeping the distance, but you have to steer on your own. 
Um, the next step would probably to help you a little bit driving in a traffic jam, but these cars are not yet fully autonomous. On the other hand side, um, could you imagine that all these shared cars wouldn't need a driver anymore? Well, then you need a whole package of technology in it, a tremendous amount of sensors, a tremendous amount of computing technology in order to handle all of the situations that can, can happen in, in especially urban environments. And this is a big leap. This is a revolutionary step, and it costs a lot of money to bring it into these cars. But these cars are owned usually by companies which provide then mobility services. And that is basically why these cars do have the economical power, or the companies do have the economical power to provide you full autonomy, really driverless taxis. Um, you may have seen this uh, in the past somewhere. This is uh, official guiding on what is the definitions of grades of autonomy. Let me have some words of it. The level zero of autonomy means basically the driver drives and that's it. That is just no autonomy at all. First level of automation, level one, is that a driver is getting help from the driver, so the driver uh, and a system together will do steering and acceleration. That is the typical case in uh, what you call ACC. Who knows ACC? Okay. Uh, could be more. Uh, basically, you have a radar in the car which measures the distance to the front-running vehicle, and the car keeps automatically distance to the front-running vehicle, but you'd have to do the steering, okay? Steering is yours, distance keeping is the car, that's the typical case of level one. Now imagine we go one step beyond and we steer as well. We do the distance keeping, the speed keeping, and we do the steering. Um, but we cannot guarantee that we would do it right under every circumstance. Probably sometimes the car doesn't see things right, would probably drop the lane. So you as a driver need to pay attention what the car is doing. This is what we call a level two. The system drives, but the driver has to monitor. By the way, pretty tricky, because the car has to somehow recognize where you're still doing your job as a driver, paying attention to the road, or whether you started doing something different. Um, better is the system level number three. The car will do the driving on its own. It will even guarantee that it makes safe actions and it will handle everything that it shall handle under certain circumstances, but there may be situations that the car cannot handle. Imagine driving on a highway, and probably we say, well, construction zones we cannot handle. So before arriving in a construction zone, the car will tell you, hey, you have to take back, you will get a beep, you will get some blinking lights or whatsoever, and the car asks you to take back driving activity. So you take over, drive through the construction zone, and passing it, you reactivate and the car continues driving. This is level three. Um, level four, that's pretty much autonomy already. So the car would, under certain areas, do everything. It can drive every situation. You probably still have to restrict and say it can do urban driving, it can do highway driving, it can do highway dri uh, urban driving within a, within a certain area, but you don't need a driver. Not at all. This is level four. And this is tremendous. That means the car manages each and every situation, and there is no way of stopping and saying, hey, I don't know how to continue, because the people who are sitting in the car probably don't know, even know how to move the car. And level five, um, well, it says on the, on the right-hand side, all use cases, that's probably a very, very high level, because all use cases is you probably need to handle each and every situation, each and every piece of road, each and every uh, probably even off-road track. Um, let's see whether we get to level five really. So that is probably the reason why many companies say they are trying to target level four slash five. They don't dare to say it's really five. So. What's coming up then in the world um, on these levels? We have several products that we are currently developing. We have the classical highway products, the traffic jam pilot and the traffic jam assist. Um, Bosch naming is pretty transparent. If it's called assist, it's a level two system, so that means you have to pay attention. If it's pilot, it's a level three system, the car does it on its own. So level 
level two and three traffic jam driving um, is partially already available or will come onto the market pretty soon. The next step, beginning of the next decade, will be the highway pilot and highway assist technologies so that it takes really free driving on highways. I'm personally looking forward to that. That will take me to my, my office every morning. Um, we have, as well, parking technologies, automated valley parking and remote parking. Automated valley parking is a pretty tricky thing. You can drop your car in front of a specially equipped parking lot and then the parking lot guides the vehicle through all the, uh, the areas of the car parking lot to a fixed slot where it will stand. And as you arrive back, you just call your car and it will get back to you. This will be on the market as well pretty soon. We do have a cooperation with uh, Daimler for that. And um, I'm currently working on this, the urban automated taxi. Urban automated taxi really is level four, five, no driver in there as well. In this case, we are cooperating with Daimler, uh, having several locations in Sunnyvale, in the Stuttgart area, in Ulm area. So there are our development teams and we're really trying to get rid of uh, the drivers in the car. So taking it in a nutshell, um, you have two types of automated branches of, of, of vehicles. One is the privately owned vehicles. Uh, at Bosch, we call it the Blue World. It's just for historic reason. Some, boy, some guy started to make a blue box around it, so that's our Blue World. Um, it has about 15 sensors in it. We expect it has a rather low usage. Cars are usually used about two hours per day, not more. The rest is just standing in the garage. On the other hand side, we have uh, this fully urban automated taxis. We expect that we can use them 12 to 18 hours. More than 40 sensors will be in this car. And um, obviously, this is a system which is highly driven by availability, because if you want to provide taxi services, the more you drive, the better is the car. So what challenges do we have? What have, do we have to deal with uh, when we talk about automated driving? Um, well, first of all, obviously, there's legislation. If you follow it up, some countries have made a push towards legislation, which allows us to drive really autonomy in full autonomy, especially in the US. Germany has recently released a first law draft, which would allow us to drive at least up to level three, but still with driver. Full autonomy in Europe is still not allowed. So there's still some way to go. I said cars will be internet, uh, connected, so security becomes a topic for automated cars. Um, but then, step by step, we go through, we have to find a system architecture, we'll have some word on that, which is safe enough. We have to pay attention to surround sensing, to see enough of what happens around the car. We have to localize ourselves to know where we are. Um, safety is an extremely big issue. You've been following the news, surely, and one of our utmost goals is that we will produce a car which is really safe under all circumstances, so that there's a lot of theoretical brain work behind it to figure out what can happen to a car. I tend to say we have the advanced engineering guys, they are the dreamers, they're trying to make everything possible, and then you hand it over to the mass production developers and then you are ending up with the paranoid guys who are seeing that everything can fail at any, any time. And if you ask them, can we do that? You for sure get a no. So um, the, the trick is to bring the dreamers and the paranoids together and make something great that is a product later. Um, so decision making is something that we're working on, very much of artificial intelligence in it. And then you have to validate and prove that the product is right and safe. So safety, as I said, is of, for us of the utmost fundamentals. We will never compromise safety. What is the steps as you do automated driving? Three disciplines, sense, think, act, and I will guide you a little bit through these disciplines. Um, sense means get a notion of what is happening all around you, but sense has as well to do something with know where you are. Um, if, if, if you want to find um, Stage number, who knows where the Bosch booth is? That's bad. I hope after you all will try to figure out where the Bosch booth is. But what would you need in order to find it? Huh? Autonomous car would be a perfect solution. Other? Huh? A phone? And what is on the phone? Uh, basically a map. 
And the second thing which is on the phone is something that tells you where you are on this map. So that is what we call localization. So then the next thing is think. So you have to figure out what do we do with what I perceive all around me and uh, what, what I know where I am. And then act means transmit that what you have been decided to do into a valid action plan in the car. For sensing, we use several sensors, video, radar, laser scanners, ultrasonics. Any idea why we use so many sensors in there? Isn't video camera good? Why don't we take just the video camera? When it's dark, it doesn't work. Right. When it's dark, it doesn't work. Or point your handy camera towards one of these uh, lights, headlights. That's just blinded. So you never can rely just on a camera. You always have to figure out, out there in the world, what sensors do you need to see really everything under all circumstances. And there's a lot of um, yeah, working through use cases in order to find out where, uh, which sensors you really need. Um, then localization, video, radar, global navigation systems, uh, inertial sensors. We combine several disciplines in order to be pretty sure that we know where the car is just located up to a precision of plus minus 10 centimeters, we know where the car is located. Try to do that with the GNSS only. You usually end up, with, uh, well, I'm roughly in a space of 30 meters all around myself. Um, thinking and planning what I do has the discipline sensor data fusion. You have to bring all these sensors together to one picture. Imagine 40 sensors, every sensor distributed in the car, and you have to make them consolidate into one solid picture of the environment. And then you have to do that with a certain redundancy. If one system fails, you always should have a second system that tells you, hey, you just failed. You may not rely on these data. And you have to make sure that you have a safe and legal driving. Obviously, make sure that there is no collisions, that you will not harm anybody, that you will not put anybody into danger. And then at the end of the day, act means bring all this into the, onto the road. You need steering. You need braking. But I will have some words on that later. Um, I will come to that redundancy is very, very crucial all through the, through the car. You never would rely on just one system. You ever need a second source of information or best a third opinion to tell you what is out there, to be really sure. Imagine you have two guys, one says yes, one says no, whom do you trust? So we would probably ask a third guy to tell you and then you take vote of majorities. So, sensors, as I said, video technology, radar technology, laser scanners are in there. This is, this is our basic working horses. And um, localization is a, is a pretty tricky thing. How do you find your position in space? Uh, the one or the other of you who is in robotics will probably know how that works. Uh, one is the satellite-based localization. You just get an absolute position from a satellite, probably the correction service, and then you know where you are. You're, the only thing that you have to do is go into a map and place yourself into the map, and then you know where you are. But there is still another thing, because satellites are not that reliable. This is landmark-based localization. Mm. How does landmark-based localization work? Mm -hmm. imagine, Im imagine your... Your flat, okay? You're in your flat. Several rooms, hopefully, in the flat. And um, now I blind your eyes, turn you several times, and I bring you to some space into your flat, and then I open up the blinds. You will surely know where you are in your flat, wouldn't you? How would you do this? Any idea? Indicators. Pardon me? Yeah, indicators. Indicators? Yeah. Such as? Yes, recognize the chair, recognize the furniture, recognize whatsoever what is a room. So there are kind of landmarks in there that tell you where you are. And the funny thing is, even if you take some of these away and just leave a different room with the shape, you still recognize where you are. And this is what we call landmark-based localization. So that we tell the vehicle, what to pay attention to, what is the landmarks where you have to look at, and from these comparisons that what the car perceives and compares it with landmarks which are on the road, the car knows precisely where it is. We call that the radar road signature. When we do that with radar data, you can do that as well with laser scanners and video. So you combine 
localization data and planning data into one map. Can you imagine how a map like this for a whole city looks like? This is huge. There's a tremendous amount of data. And that is the reason why we say these maps are definitely connected. Connected maps, and we need to get them from a server. They need to be updated. They need to be validated all the time. And we need to make sure that the data in the map is always reliable. So and this is the point where the connectivity comes into the automated cars, because you cannot host them into just on the car itself. Next thing is artificial intelligence, what we're working with. If you have this amount of data, video data, radar data, you have to understand them. And uh, I think artificial intelligence is in everybody's mouth. Um, I did a little bit of, of neural nets and, and uh, signal recognition back in when I did my PhD thesis. That was way before artificial intelligence and technology as of today. Now it's really great how much you can do with this technology just with a little bit of training effort with the, with the right data, which is the, the important thing with the right data. You can learn so much about the world and um, we are using that extensively in order to interpret pictures, into, in, in order to know what the video uh, uh, signatures tell us, where's the pedestrians, where's the cars, where is the trucks, and so on. And we use that as well in order to define which is the best action, or to predict how somebody will move into, an, into the environment. Obviously, this is new to automotive technology. We had in the past very small control units that was not computer, that was very, very small control units with about 128K, 756K, that is what you had, microcontrollers. Now we're talking about using artificial intelligence. That means we have to learn how to handle big amount of data, we have to generate big vehicle fleets in order to learn, we have to create data center, we have to establish training centers for CNN, so we're installing big GPUs clusters for our training of, of our networks, and we're developing new CPUs, which are now liquid-cooled and which have about 100 to 1,000 factor more calculation power that the current uh, ECUs do have in vehicles. So this is a big leap in vehicle control units that have to be developed, and at the end of the day, we have to establish as well virtual testing to make sure that the technology or that the, the nets we have developed are really reliable then at the end of the day in the car. So, how do we decide uh, that we do the right driving path? Um, situation like that. Um, that are the typical situations where the car has to decide, do I stay in lane, do I make a lane shift? And um, the funny thing, how these algorithms work is um, they're pretty human. Um, you can do that with uh, heuristics, and heuristics means you give kind of a cost function to each of the trajectories. You calculate hundreds of tra trajectories which are possible in the scenario, but how do you know which is the right one? Um, the human beings tend to say, well, first of all, it has to be safe, so no collision. It has to be risk mitigating, so you can judge risk. But then how do you decide whether you brake or better do a lane change to the left or right if everything is free? And there comes something into play which we call the jerk. Um, people don't like if the car changes speed or velocity. Braking is something that people do not like. Lane changing is something, so lateral movement, which people as well do not like, but they hate braking more than lane change to the left or lane change to the right. Uh, you probably witnessed that when you drive on the highway, when people should usually stay in lane and brake because you're approaching from the rear, they still will do a lane change and brake you down, and you could say, hey, is that really necessary? Um, people do that just because of these preferences. So we judge these trajectories by the very same way, to make them as jerk-free as possible and preferably lateral jerk instead of longitudinal jerk, but be sure we will not break somebody down from the rear. We first check whether there's somebody arriving before we do a lane change. Um, then the next step is that you need actuation system in the car. You need to have brakes, you need to have steering. Oh, that's boring. Every car has brakes and steering. Um, but if you have a usual car, and imagine the, the um, electric power steering system is failing. What would you do? Electric power steering in your car fails, any idea? You, you still steer on your own, you just have to apply more force. Or if the brake support fails, 
the brake booster fails, you still brake. You just have to apply more force. You're, you are the fallback system of your car. That's pretty comfortable for the automotive engineers. The driver is always in the car and does the job if the system as such fails. If there is no driver, that doesn't work. So that is the reason why we apply redundant technologies. We have redundant braking system. We have redundant steering systems in the car, um, which pretty much look like that. You have an electric boost system and you have the classical ESP, which form a dual braking system. And we have a specially developed electric and, um, power steering system, which has a so-called motor-in-motor concept. The mechanics is the same as a standard, uh, but it has two electric and electronical systems included into one power steering. So you basically have a really redundant steering, even though the mechanics is just one. So we now walk through the technology of automated driving. Let's walk a little bit about through culture and thinking. Engineers know that. That's the V. And the V is always a V model. So, so the classical way of waterfall engineering. First we specify, then we do the architecture, then we do the design, then we implement and we walk through. Would that work? In this situation where we try to bring a car into the living world, that would mean that we really have to specify and design everything in advance which is happening in the world. That doesn't, doesn't work. We just can't forget about it. We, we have to do it differently. I cannot imagine how I would specify each and every situation out there in the world. So we obviously have to change our way of acting, thinking, developing. The old style will not work anymore. And that means that we have to apply as a company to completely new styles of working and cooperating. If you do change the way of engineering, you have to change the way how you act. You have to change the way how you think. You have to, check, uh, to change the way how you manage your teams and handle your teams. And um, obviously one thing is that the agile development methods that we apply would say, okay, we want to have a certain specification, we want to achieve a certain target, but we will not hit the target, but we do a step-by-step -step approach, we will iterate ourselves, and we will end up somewhere near where we want it to be, but surely we have to acknowledge that it will be different from what we have been thinking in the very beginning. And this is kind of a, we call it experienced driven, driven development cycle. It's not a V model in that case anymore. You start coding, you do a software release, you do testing, you learn what you have made wrong, and then you enter back into the circle of coding, software releasing, testing, and so on. You run through this until you are satisfied. At the end of the day, it's still important that you know what have you done, why did you do it, and how did you solve it? So in each and every of these steps, we still have to write our test specifications, our KPIs, what we want to achieve, the requirements that we really want to assure that we have solved them at the end of the day. But we will not do it from the very beginning by requirements and then walk through, but rather have an iterative process. And this is a big change in the way how we start developing cars. Um, that means as well that we have to adapt our organization. Um, we have a new way of acting and thinking at Bosch, how we handle organizations, how we have a mindset we want to become, and we are working more agile in the attitude of our teams and of our managers. We are rearranging our organizations to more agile teams instead of classical project architectures. And the way how we, we want our te teams to act is be more user-centric, thinking towards what is the value at the end of the day for the customer, and self-empowered, find the right way in order to approach our products more and more and more towards this user-friendly, at the end of the day, product that we have. Um, one thing that we apply in that is the so-called SAFE framework. SAFE means that we are working with agile methods, such as Scrum, for example. But since our teams are huge, we're about 400 people, uh, we need to how somehow synchronize all of these Scrum teams to work jointly together. There's a, a big, big uh, framework for that, which is called SAFE, that works in program increments, so that every Scrum team's plans in program increments. We agree on what we want to achieve in these program increments, and then the Scrum teams work individually 
towards this program increment goal. A very fascinating thing for me is, and it comes down at the bottom, the servant leadership style. Um, if you sit in these PI planning meetings, just currently we have running one, then the teams will sit down and they will focus on what we ask them to achieve in the next round. And then they will tell us, okay, we can achieve that, but there are certain hurdles. And at the end of the planning session, we sit together and they confront us with certain hurdles. And they say, if you do not solve hurdle one, two, three, four, five, we will not achieve your goals. And we have no ways to object. We will not push for them. It's rather than we sit down and say, okay, how can we remove the hurdles? And the team usually gives us time until the morning, uh, next day morning, eight o'clock. And if we solved it until eight o'clock next morning, the team commits and says, we achieve it. And if we didn't solve it, well, then we don't get the results. So that's a pretty different way of acting with the engineering teams. It's, it's more than giving the responsibility and empowerment to the teams to judge how to solve things and how to solve problems and how to go ahead and giving to the management the task to remove the hurdles. So um, what is important with that, if you do that, you have to change the leadership attitude towards the teams. Um, if you have witnessed in the past this push mode, pushing people to achieve more and more and more, that's not the way how we want to work. And that's not the way how you achieve big results in such complex situations, because you need the judgment and the expertise of each of the engineers to the utmost of their self, how would I say, uh, self-motivated way. So pushing is not the way how to do it. It's rather to sit together down with the team, say, what can we achieve? make sure that we remove the hurdles, protect the team from overburdening, and make sure that they have the environment and surroundings and the tools and, and, and all they need in order to have maximum speed in, in engineering. So this is a different style of leadership, which we are currently training and, integrate and, and integrating into the Bosch culture. And I must say, it's, it's really fun to work with that. Um, you need to change a little bit the way how you take a look at things. But this, uh, I have always big fun in these PI sessions, uh, sessions, especially when the team comes at the end of the day to me and says, one, two, three, four, five tasks to you. Either you solve it or you're lost. That's a good thing. So with that, um, I'm at the end of this presentation. I hope I could give you a little bit of an idea of what is in automated driving, what is the technologies, as well as the new technologies in automated driving. And one key message is you cannot do automated driving just as you did it in the past with the normal products. You have, the way, you have to change the way how you engineer, how you work, how you set up your teams, and that brings a completely new culture into your teams. So thank you very much. <laughs> this guy, I mean, that's incredible. I like that. Stay around for a couple of questions. I like the curve you made from the end to the beginning, that you have to change the way you actually run your projects. You're changing the way we drive cars. Yes. But you're actually changing the way you run projects. So Ex those two things are kind of exactly. connected. Exactly. You, you, right. change, you change technology, you change competence, you change the way how you use the cars, and you change the way how you design and engineer. Okay, those leaving the room, keep quiet. Psh, we've got a few questions here. Um, okay, yeah, what year? I like this question, but 39 people liked it too. So the give one. us a year. Now, now, yeah, a year. Get it. What is it? When, when do, do you, you think, think fully automated cars are in all scenarios reality? We need a date. In all scenarios. In all scenarios, that's probably 2040. But reasonably on the road, 25 to 2030. And the first ones will be taxi. I think so. <laughs> but the first ones will be taxis, and they'll be here 2020. Um, I showed you the both areas. Taxis will be one thing, the fully autonomous ones, and the ones that, that you still drive and activate automation as you want. That's the other ones. That's some, a couple of good questions. I saw them earlier. Yeah, I know this is, you're not a lawyer, <laughs> but the, I, I read something the other day about open standards for autonomous vehicles. So you can yeah. say, well, we kept to the standard. What's the boss position on that? Um, on, on top question do here. Do yes. you mean the top question about uh, yeah. who shall be guilty in case of accidents with AVs? Um, honestly speaking, um, if the system commits a failure, then obviously the system is guilty. 
So what, what we have to provide is a car which does not commit failures out there. Whether that is possible is just another question. Yeah, but you have to define failure. But it's failure. not the driver. But you have to define failure. Failure is um, reasonably avoidable accidents must be avoided. He said reasonably avoidable. Yep. A lawyers hate the word reasonable. Yep. <laughs> reasonable means um, whatever we do, we will provide you a car which drives safer as a human driver, I can promise. That won't be good enough. But I cannot promise that I will jump the barriers of physics. There are some accidents which happen which are just due to physics. If, if, if just in front of you somebody crosses the road that you could not see before, yeah. What we have, will you do? Well, we have, to learn to, uh, we have to learn to interpret statistics about dead people killed by robots. Yeah. We have to do that. It's going to happen. We have to do it. It won't be fun. We accept today that more than 30,000 people worldwide die from accidents. Yeah. Is that okay if we reduce it to, let's say, 10% of it? Or is it okay if we reduce it to 1% of it? But the 99.9 is the goal, right? It's, uh, the, the goal is zero. Achievable yeah. is another question, you but heard the design goal is zero. The goal is zero. Uh, a quick one on the Tesla. What promise? Do you think Tesla can keep their promise? What promise? I don't know what promise is in there. <laughs> to burn lots of money? Sure. <laughs> yeah. Do we can all agree that any connected... To, yeah, it can be hacked. Sure. How can we guarantee the connected cars won't have a security oh. issues? It's a similar That's question. That's a good one. Um, current cars do not have any security measures, measures, or let's say the cars that we knew from the past. What we are applying now is a, um, a shell-style uh, security um, mechanism in there. One is a classical firewall. Second is that uh, we designed the EE architecture that the, the entry point is as, as far as possible from the actuators. So you do have to go through several gateways in order to get from a connected device down to where you really have the actuation in the car. Second. Third is the communication between the control units will be secured. And the third is the security, this, this encryption of communication between the control units will be run by a hardware device, which does a very complicated encryption. So I think this fourfold yeah, level should take us. Yeah, you're building a very, very strong funnel there, but the, yep. the, you can't rule out the fact that they will be hacked. Um, but I can make sure that I can, uh, they might be hacked, but I can make sure that the hackers won't get to a point where it really creates harm. What well, is the scenario? Yeah. The scenario is that we have a fleet of cars out there and somebody hacks himself into 100 cars and they all make a full braking or steering to the right or steering to the left. That is something that we sure can avoid. Okay. Um, last one, sorry about the time. But last one question, and apologies to Sebastian because it's a good question, but Tim's gets my points. If the AV is sticking to the rules, yeah. what about all the other people? Can I just walk in front of a car and cross the road whenever I want? <laughs> That's as well a great question. Um, I think I cannot convince people themselves to stick to the rules. So that is the reason why our cars will drive very, very carefully, because they always are trying to figure out whether somebody could probably not stick to the rules and cross our ways or drive into our runways. And that's the reason why the car will drive very, very carefully. But you, yeah, but that's gridlock in English. What is that? That's, that's the definition of gridlock. Because yeah. if I'm walking through a city which has 70% AVs, yeah. I can just say, right, I'm going to cross the road here and just walk across the road. And I can expect all the AVs to stop. Yep. So that's chaos. <laughs> it's fantastic for cyclists. You, um, there, there is one car out on the, just, just to, uh, it's very strong here. There's one car out on, on, on the market which you could, could stop as well as a pedestrian. How much has that happened? Yeah. Okay. The, the, the good yeah. thing is that people are sometimes crazy, but not as crazy as being jumping on the road all the time voluntarily in order to see whether this car really stops or not. <laughs> no, but if... All right, I'll leave it. We don't have time for this, but... I tell you, when this comes, I'm going to have so much fun. <laughs> There's going to be flash mobs in Vienna city center, and we're going to bring the whole city to No, I'm kidding you. I thought this was incredibly inspiring. I hope you did too. I mean, this is really future stuff here. You heard it here first, I hope. Um, please give a warm round of applause to Michael Faustin. Thank you. Thanks, Michael.